<laughs> okay, so here we go. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna run through these things and see how they apply. So when we talk about economic costs, of course, we're always including um, implicit as well as explicit cost is how I like to divide it up in um, micro class. So opportunity cost is equal to our explicit cost plus implicit cost. So somebody give me an example of a explicit cost for out of the university. Let's say we're running a university. What's an explicit cost as part of the university's efforts and the cost that they incur? What's an explicit cost? Salaries to the teachers. Yeah, so my salary, right? So it's an easy number. It has a receipt, right? So this is really accounting cost. So this is Professor Wagner's area here, right? So all things that have an easy receipt or price tag, you spend some money on it. Um, so that's part of your opportunity cost because if we spent, um, if we spent uh, five thousand, uh, let, let's just say forty thousand dollars hiring um, somebody to do the maintenance around here, we could have spent that forty thousand on something else, right? So it's definitely, there's an opportunity that we missed, or a cost of 40,000 that we could have spent it on something else, right? So it's just an explicit cost. And then what is an implicit cost? Anybody give me an example of an implied cost or an implicit cost? Something come to mind. It doesn't have to be related to Ottawa University, so you can do, um, anything. You can think about your time being in class. Instead of being in class, I could be eating a big fat cheeseburger. Okay, yes. big fat cheeseburger. What else could you guys be doing? Somebody else? Sleep, working, Sleep, working right? So um, that all has a value to you, right? I mean, do you value your sleep? Do you value eating cheeseburgers? Do you value, all of that has value. Now it's subjective value, so Lawson's value that he places on the cheeseburger is different than what Carlos would place on the cheeseburger, right? So it's implied, it's implicit in us, and it might be our time, but we can value it somehow. And it, especially when it comes down to working, that might be easier. We can say, well, I, I missed out on working for $10 an hour, right? So I like to think of this as economic art. This is where econ starts to differentiate itself from accounting. For accounting, we need the receipt. If we're gonna deduct it as an expense for the IRS, um, the fact that I could have been working can't be part of my cost uh, in uh, the expense of my business. So the example I do in micro class that you might remember is you see an English professor opens up a restaurant. They were working for $60,000 at OU and so they're going to include their $60,000 lost opportunity of working for OU as part of the cost of running the restaurant, right? And so that is over on this side, the implied cost. And then we had some actual cost of running the restaurant with rent for the building and deep fryers and labor and all of that stuff was accounting cost. So which one's bigger? Opportunity cost, and we could say economic cost, right? Economic opportunity cost. Which one is bigger, accounting cost or opportunity cost in full? Which one's larger? Opportunity. Opportunity cost. So um, when we do the, this kind of tied back to our profit calculation, what's the equation for profits? Total revenue total minus total cost. cost. Total revenue minus total cost. And so if this equals zero, does that mean the business owner is losing money? No. no, because their implicit costs are also included in there. And so economic profit, if there are implied costs, which there always is, there's no such thing as a free lunch, is less than accounting profit. 
economic profit's going to be smaller because not only do we have all the accounting costs, but we have implied costs added to it as well. Okay, so questions or comments there? <clears throat> so hopefully you gave a little read to this. If we're using money, we could have lost interest. So the other example I like to go through in micro class is the restaurant needs a new grill. And the grill, the price of the grill is $10,000 today. But the leasing company says, hey, we'll give you a zero down. Uh, you can pay $11,000 a year from now, right? So there's an implied interest rate of 10%. Should I pay cash or should I do the leasing thing? What's the answer? So cash today of 10,000 versus 11,000 of cash. And by the way, I have 40,000 in my account. I can cut it, I can pay cash easy today. But should I do it with the implied interest rate of 10%? No. And I'm not looking for a Dave Ramsey it, uh, answer here, by the way, since this is a business-related question. Because uh, the Dave Ramsey one is don't do debt, don't do debt, don't do debt. Yeah, okay. But I differ from Ramsey on, on business debt, um, I think is something you can entertain in a safe way. So what does, should I do the leasing deal or not? The 10% basically financing, or should I pay cash? Cash, cash. 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 Kind of depends on if you're gonna use Anybody this. on the financing? I do financing if you're gonna use that cash or something else. Okay, Bryce has got the right answer, nice and loud. Oh, if you can get 12% on your money over that year, or anything more than 10%, it makes sense to just invest that money Yep. So it's the classic college answer, it depends. If your opportunity cost is 6%, should you pay cash or do the financing? Yeah. Pay cash, right? So it depends on what your opportunity cost is. So if you can borrow at 10% is effectively what you're doing with the restaurant, but you have an opportunity to add an arcade to your restaurant, and you can use that 10,000 and you think you're gonna bring in families and new people and generate an additional 30% return on a $10,000 investment in arcades and pinball machines and stuff and kind of uh, changing up your restaurant, that's a 30% opportunity, right? So you can use that for those things. But if you're only earning 2% on, and if that's your opportunity cost, then pay cash, right? So it depends on what your opportunity cost. So, and there we're kind of using a little bit of a present value type uh, thought of thinking about 11,000 tomorrow versus that, there's an opportunity cost of the entrepreneur's funds. What else could they be doing with their money? All right. So building a skyscraper. So somebody talked about building, uh, brought up the question of the things we went over yesterday, going high or not, building low. What would be the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur's funds? So you're getting into real estate development, which is what I did for 20 years or 18 years. So what would be the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur's funds? Yeah, shove it in the stock market or some other investment, right? So if it's not a skyscraper, maybe it's a housing subdivision. But maybe it's not real estate, maybe it's the stock market, right? And so this is, you know, wealth consulting and financial consulting is everybody's a little bit different. Like what is really your opportunity cost is what you need to really think hard about. Um, if, if, uh, you're, if you reasonably expect to get 10% in the stock market and this real estate deal looks like about 10%, but the real estate deal has a lot more risk than a diversified portfolio investment, you probably should do that. You need to do a little risk adjustment too, right? It's not just calculating the spreadsheet rate of return. Uh, okay, what about the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur's time? How would that play into the skyscraper versus stock market thing? Could be building something else. Could be building something else, okay, good. What about the stock market versus the skyscraper? What's that, Bryce? Go play golf all day. Go play, yeah, yeah, we plug it. You take a diversified portfolio and not really watch the stock market, but just you know put it in there, take the long position, you're free to do whatever you want. 
But if you're going to build a skyscraper, you might have to babysit it to some capacity. If you're, if you're not building it yourself, you're hiring a contractor. Who's going to be monitoring the contractor, right? All of those management type things. You might lose a little more sleep at night compared to, to doing it. So um, opportunity cost of time needs to be considered too. So give that a read. So what's open space? Anybody got an idea what that is? Open space. It'd be like that land you're talking about here in Ottawa that's been used for like five or six years. Not in this context. So that's just vacant property. That's just vacant property. That's what I was wondering if it's kind of a word you use in real estate development a little bit, but we're going to use it a lot in this class as we explore different things. Yeah, so undeveloped land. Uh, again, I would want to be careful. It's, it, it's, actually, it's actually developed land in, in this contest of open space. So what do you see in a new housing subdivision in terms of its design? Where would the developer, they're doing building lots and everything. So loss in number between three and seven? Four. One, two, three, four, eight. What do you see in a housing subdivision that relates to the idea of open space? Maybe a brand new subdivision anywhere. You're from Iowa, it could be in Iowa. That's where I developed, did real estate development. So you're driving into a development. What would you consider open space in terms of, you see the, the houses with lots, right? And there's a house built on them. What would you see as you're driving through the neighborhood that would, you would consider it being a possibility of being open space. Visualize. You're driving through the subdivision. What do you see? Tell me what you're looking at. You're driving right through a subdivision in anywhere USA. Close your eyes. Everybody, close. this is a good exercise. You're closing your eyes. You're driving through anywhere USA. Tell me the things, just start telling me the things you're looking at out your windshield. Street lights. No, 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 no. This is gay. Houses. Houses? Keep going. You're looking. Just drive down the street and tell me. House, house, house. Mailbox. Okay, stop sign. Keep going. Keep driving. Does it ever change from house, 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 house? What's the next thing you run into? Okay, maybe a business, good. Keep going, keep driving. Like a cornfield. Okay, cornfield. What else do you see? Keep driving through that neighborhood. It's a big neighborhood. We could be here for an hour driving around the neighborhood. What else do you see? Come on. Street lights, good. Keep going, keep driving. I got, uh, we got the whole hour here, so we still got another 53 minutes. Keep driving. What do you see? People, okay. I'll tell you when to stop, you just keep going. Keep driving, keep whatever you're seeing out your windshield. You're in a neighborhood now, neighborhoods have families, so they're, some of those people could be little guys and girls. Okay, and where are they at? Okay, out of school. Where else? In an open lot, okay. They're not be on their driveway with some sidewalk chalk. Where else are those kids? At the park. At the park. At the open space. The undeveloped land that's shared communally with other people. So in the subdivision, you've got your housing lots. House, 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 here's Gabe driving down the street. House, house, house. 
And then there's the playground. Maybe there's a little lake here, some people fishing. There's Russ with his fishing pole on the pond around the area. There's some picnic tables, a couple slides. Oops, the slide goes into the street. That might be dangerous for the kids. Um, that's open space. So it's intentional space that's left undeveloped to be used. Now, why do we do that? Do we want to potentially protect the birds? Maybe. So wildlife, the deers, the squirrels, whatever, environmental issues. And so when the city allowed the real estate developer who's trying to maximize what? Profit. Profit. Do you think the developer might have wanted to put a lot there instead of a park? Yeah. Possibly. Now, developers also, by the way, think about that. My lots, can, I'm going to be able to sell this lot for more money if there's an amenity that serves the people that I'm attracting for the house, right? So they don't need the government to say X amount of open space, but the government has gotten involved with retention areas and ponds and water runoff and all of that stuff uh, can be part of your open space. So open space is intentional space on developed land as opposed to just a vacant lot. And it can take multiple forms, but it used to be, usually needs to be an impervious service what does it mean to be impervious? They can't be impervious surface, sorry. What's an impervious surface? What can't go through that floor very easily? It falls from the sky. Rain. Right, so the amount of hard surface makes a difference when you're doing it, and so it has to be some sort of soil to absorb, and then the water runoff that channels from the street might go to the retention pond, right? But that can all be part of the open space. And so all that stuff is some of the issues that have uh, opportunity costs built into them. It's like, oh, I could be doing something else rather than putting up a playground in the slide. Uh, there's other uses for that land. Okay, any other ones uh, look appealing up there? Prison, we could be using that prison for something else other than uh, we do, our prisons too full or not full enough? Do we need more prisons or less? I'm not gonna get into a big criminal uh, discussion, but we are gonna talk about that later. But So do we need to make decisions on letting some people out mm -hmm. yeah. if it gets full, yeah. right? So those are opportunity cost issues of, well, I really want this bad guy to be there. This guy, you know, he smokes some pot and stuff, but let's let him go. He's probably not as big of a danger to society as this guy who did whatever act, right? So opportunity cost plays into all that. All right, so marginal analysis, of course, is one of the top principles of economics. Um, when I make this decision, uh, we're gonna break it down to a small increment of the impacts of that decision. So what's the additional cost? What's the additional benefit? Real simple, if the benefits outweigh the cost, do it. If not, don't, right? That is the whole story. And so we're gonna apply the marginal principle in multiple ways um, in this class in kind of different ways than we ever did in micro class, like building height. So do I go 20 stories or 30 stories? So if we want 100,000 square feet of space for an office space, should we build 10 stories of 10,000 square foot or 20 stories of 5,000 square foot and go taller, right? Or a thousand square feet of a thousand foot building or whatever. You know, how do we, how do we decide that? And so um, why would the benefit curve be downward sloping? Okay, in what respect? Put it in the context of, of this diminishing benefit. In fact, let me go to the number generator, Bryce. Um, one, two, three, four, Kaylin. Okay, yeah. Taking long, yeah, there'd be an opportunity cost of riding that long elevator, elevator congestion. Is there much of a difference between the 20th floor and the 18th floor? No, no. so as you get higher and higher, there, there can be diminishing benefit to the, to the building height. And as we'll learn later, uh, it gets more and more costly to build high buildings. Imagine the crane that you have to do once you get above a certain level. 
Um, once you get above uh, three stories, three stories is the maximum in wood construction using um, normal two by four lumber. And once you go to four stories, then you're into steel frames. And so that can uh, cause added cost. Um, the taller the building, the thicker the steel needs to be at the base to support it. So we get into all kinds of things that'll drive up the marginal cost of an additional floor uh, will continue to go up. <clears throat> Now, I would have to amend this slide. This is straight from your author. Some of these I've altered, but I didn't alter this one. Uh, local governments use the marginal principle to make decisions of hiring teachers, public safety programs. They do? Uh, I hope they do. So my little friendly amendment would be local governments, what would you put right here? Should. should use that, but they often lack incentives to do that. Businesses, however, do do that when we have employees and programs that aren't working. What does the boss do or the manager do? Fire them. Fire them. They're gone, right? So there's a profit incentive and a profit motive to utilize the, the marginal principle. So up here, we're talking about efficient decision making because profits are leading us to do so here it gets a little mucky we'd, we'd like them to do that because that would be efficient for not only local but uh, federal and other governments to do um, and they certainly would um, kind of pretend to do that they don't even always pretend to do that I take that back because uh, it'll usually be something like well, we should have a new playground because we need safe space and the kids need that little special spongy uh, uh, rubber thing so that if their little bodies go and they smack it, you know, they, they got a nice big cushion. And then they're like, oh, yeah, we got to save the kids, help the kids. But what's the question that doesn't get answered at that public meeting for what's local? What's the cost? What's the cost? Yeah. So if we have a... You know, there's different levels. I mean, we can maybe, there's another choice that's not, instead of being $10,000, it's still a pretty, you know, we're not putting razors and, and other things out there for kids, but it's another safer alternative that would be $2,000, right? So um, some municipalities might take that up and think about the cost, but a lot of times that's what happens. The focus is all on the benefits because the cost, oh, that's something that the taxpayers are gonna pay. That's somebody else's money. It's not my money, the decision maker. And when, uh, when it does have a cost impact of, a, of somebody's pocket, they're usually at the meeting being the one that, oh, but this is gonna cost more, we should do this. And, but even for them, uh, they don't have as much incentive to go to that meeting if they're just paying a fraction of a percent of that overall cost because it's getting spread to everybody. Okay. Nash Equilibrium. So, does anybody remember Nash Equilibrium from game theory? It's where you end up because both have a dominant strategy. Nope, don't need a dominant strategy, but dominant strategy was one thing. That's anybody else? Kalen? Neither party wants to change taking as given what the other one's doing. So basically, if we're at this solution value, um, no, it's neither party wants to say, oh, I want to I want to switch to this. Right. So neither party wants to change their choice, taking as given uh, what the other one is doing. So that's kind of what this one's saying here, given the choices made by others. So it's a it's a stable um, uh, Nash and I'm talking about John Nash now said, well, if we have a situation where there's no tendency to change, that's kind of a nice definition of equilibrium. And so that's how that got writ written in for equilibrium. All right, so supply and demand. We don't really say the word Nash equilibrium typically. We just say, oh, it's where the two lines cross, right? And we got the uh, supply and the demand and the two lines cross at price and quantity. And But if we now put the Nash equilibrium language to it, we're saying that neither the buyer or the seller have an incentive to see a higher price because at a higher price, 
they're, the seller, there's some sellers that'll still sell their product, but they're not gonna sell all their product, right? We end up getting a surplus. If we have a shortage, buyers like low prices, but not all the buyers will get it. So we really have a Nash equilibrium here on the good old supply and demand curve uh, changing, a place where we'd expect it to come to rest. Okay, and so remember the concept of the price taker. We'll use that in here too. So in a competitive market, the prices are externally coming to you, right? And so you don't have, uh, mar we'll talk about other times where we have market power, uh, but we, in a competitive market, um, the price is set by the big picture and then you react to that price. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so that was my picture I already did. This is houses, 200 houses, 300, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I already did this for you over there. I guess I forgot this was coming up, but that's all right. Oh, actually, let me just, on the language there, though. Um, not all of you, not every textbook use it. Sometimes they use different things. So excess supply is the surplus, right? So it's just another word. There's supply in excess of what is demanded so excess supply is another word for surplus down here we have a quantity that's being demanded that is in excess of the supply available so we have a shortage or excess demand ice cream and so we're gonna assume we have a homogeneous good that each vendor has the same offerings right so we're not oh that guy carries a uh, pistachio crunch that I love so I'm gonna walk extra distance you're gonna get the same so distance is driving this model right where are they going to locate so we got lefty and righty lefty and righty the consumers are this is the model by the way so the and we're, we're going to be doing quite a bit of this this is different than you've seen in other classes so we've got 11 consumers or consumer groups they're equally live if you want to think of them living or their beach pole on this beach example they're equally distributed along the spectrum and lefty and righty are the ice cream vendors selling a homogeneous product how does the market location change over time? How do you think this market would evolve? What would be your prediction? Are we in a Nash equilibrium right now with lefty and righty over there? What do you think? Let me get somebody who hasn't talked yet. What do you think? Anybody want to volunteer, those of you who haven't talked yet? All right, where do we leave off with random number generator with? Was it with Cameron? Okay. One, two, three, four, Gabe's talk. Julian! You're asking what, what, what do I think numbers mean? Yeah, like lefty, lefty is, we're going to call this position three, but lefty's right on top of the third no. consumer, if you want to think of it. Remember, though, these consumers are distributed along the beach, and lefty is located at position three, righty is located at position nine. And so what I'm wondering is, is that an optimal location that would be sustainable? Are we in equilibrium? Nash Equilibrium said a, a situation such that neither agent wants to change, taking as given the other's move. So do you think this is an equilibrium or not? And how would it change if not? That what's what? What'd you say? I mean, nine is divisible by three, so like you can three goes into nine three times. So I would say it's equilibrium. Okay. If it was like right was at eight and left was at three, it wouldn't be the same. Okay. And so right here at this point, um, how would it? So you think neither person would want to change their location? So what we want to think about is, would lefty like to move to position two, 
or position four might be one way to look at it. I'm just picking on lefty. We could have went righty. So if you're lefty, would you like to change your location of your ice cream shop? Yeah. Yeah, which way would you go? Towards the six, four. Towards the six, four. So toward, basically to four. Basically move this way. Why, why is that optimal move? Why is that a profitable move to do? Let me stick with Julian for a little bit and then I'll move on. I agree with you, so you're right. Let me give you the confidence that you're right, but I want you to be able to explain, this is part of the explaining with your homework problems, like why would you, be, why would you want to do that? Yeah. I mean, you were you were trying to reach equilibrium, so I figured I mean, right, you could be making more money than lefty. So if you reach closer towards six, I mean, you can potentially be closer towards making as much profit as right. Who are you going to pick up if you move over? Basically, where does six go, by the way? Where does consumer six? Consumer six is indifferent, right? Because they're one, two, three spots from righty, one, two, three spots from lefty. And so consumers are always going to minimize their travel distance in equilibrium. And so by moving here to four, where is six gonna go? Now it's gonna go to left. Is this person still gonna come to you? Yeah. Yes, why? Because you're still the closest, right? Righty is still further. Okay, so where does this game end up? They're both at six. Jonathan, did you have, sorry, any other? So lefty goes straight to six. Look at all the market share changes, right? Because again, these consumers are indifferent. Now we're in the half, by the way. So we're splitting the market. But then righty says, oh my gosh, well I could go there too. And now look at where we're back to. Righty and lefty are both getting the same result, but their location changed. And that was the kind of the evolution of the market. Okay, questions or comments there? <clears throat> okay, let's start with the labor market. Can you give me an example of that? Okay, and so what? What's the desirability, I guess, factor for, in your opinion? Okay, and then the question would be, why do people work at Chopper? Because Walmart sucks. There you go. No, that's not true. I'm a, actually, I was just telling my micro class that I'm a Walmart fan. So, I but I I I pay. I I go to Chopper too. Now, you guys, some of you know where I live. So I live right by the hospital here. So back to our beachfront. Chopper is closer for me. So when I need something, but there's some days where I just don't want to go to Walmart. It's kind of icky sometimes. So. Constantino's Chopper, it's a higher end store, right? I mean, it's a nicer store. So I'm willing to pay a little bit more. And sometimes, of course, there are items that are even cheaper there than at Walmart. There's a few things. But in general, you fill up a shopping cart worth of stuff, you're going to walk out of there paying a little bit more at Chopper than you probably do at Walmart. And sometimes, dang it, it's worth it, right? So you make that decision. That's what's going on here. If, if, if uh, Chopper, according to, this is all Jacob now, this is not me speaking. But uh, if it's a nicer workplace, and just the environment is nicer than Walmart, which I think as a consumer, I would agree here locally anyway, um, in Ottawa that the environment's nicer, so maybe you'll take a buck less per hour, right? And, and then of course, back to management, and you know, there's lots of other factors that could change the desirability. So it's not just wage, that wage is going to reflect something. All right, so now let's go back up here for location. Somebody other than Jacob, give me an example of that. In fact, let's go to another non-talker at this point. If you're willing to volunteer. Okay, uh, Zeke, right? Okay. So you're willing to pay like higher prices to go, like say you 
like target a lot? So you're willing to drive to the forest to go get targeted over the testing? Um, so it could be, uh, but here they're they're looking. I'm thinking more of like, uh, well, at least what came to my mind. This is pretty general on location. Um, I'm thinking uh, different places to live, possibly. And you could do Lawrence or uh, you could do San Diego. Oh, so like if you're closer to the park. Like okay. So yeah. You pay more to be closer to something like that. Yeah. Good. So if that's important to you, then you pay a little uh, a little bit more. Okay. Other ones? Other comments come to mind on that one? Higher price for more desirable location eliminates the incentive for unilateral deviation. Would we like to live in San Diego climate if my job and everything else, it's pretty nice there. How many people have been to San Diego? Okay, it barely rains, it's just gorgeous about every day. Kind of like Guatemala where uh, Carlos, you're the only one in here that was on the trip, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Guatemala's climate is, is kind of similar like that, and um, uh, it's nice. But what is true about San Diego real estate prices? It's expensive. It's expensive. So that is, should I, should I locate my business in San Diego, or should I locate it in Ottawa, Kansas? Well, let's see. Okay, if I build my business there, I can do it, but it's going to be $5 million, or Ottawa, Kansas would be 100000 <laughs> or whatever. And that literally could be, by the way, a real difference between Ottawa, Kansas and San Diego. And so then access to your workforce, all of that stuff. So good, yeah, good example, um, Zeke, and, and uh, the location is going to matter. So that's the type of things we'll be factoring in uh, to some of our uh, work that we do in here. So a couple basics of how the author um, looks at things um, in terms of creating an economic model. So a parameter is a variable that is given to you, kind of like the price taker, right? So you can't change that. Um, it's, a, it's something that is given to you. And when we do an analysis, we can look at how that impacts uh, other variables that are a choice that we make. So just to kind of go back to principles of micro, um, I'm a competitive firm, I'm a price taker, I'm a farmer, the price of corn is $5 a bushel, I don't have any impact on the price of corn. So given the price of the parameter that corn is going to sell for $5, I choose to make X amount of acres of my land into corn, right? So the, the number of acres is the choice variable depending on the change. So steel prices have kind of gone around a little bit since President Trump uh, fought it out with, with China and we had some steel prices change. So the builder, and this happened with COVID with uh, wood construction. I don't know if you guys remember a lumber shortage big time. And, uh, Jacob works for uh, Menards and now home base. And so uh, lumber prices went kind of crazy. And so if they decrease, then you can go higher potentially. So how does that transform itself in a graph? The marginal cost that we had before for a building height of 20, now steel prices are cheaper, uh, changes the marginal cost, and we can, we'll see higher buildings being built. Um, by the way, that is what the story of New York is. Um, I think we're going to learn that in this book, if I remember right, is that uh, the skyscraper was due to innovations in steel and how they put it together. And once they figured that out, then all of a sudden New York went shot up. And that's when skyscrapers were basically invented, which I think was the, gosh, I can't remember. I think it was after World War II or was it in the 20s? No, we'll learn that as we get back. I can't remember that detail. All right. So studying our cities, We'll see lots of things with changes. Uh, one of the things that the government, um, the government kind of doing things differently, not having a, a stable uh, rule in place of, you know, can I demolish a historic building or a house that's 100 years old? If I buy it, can I just knock it down and build a new house? Some houses, the answer is yes. Some answers are no. That can change over time, so we can think about how those impact our decisions. So think about it being outside 
of whatever market you're looking at and then changing the value. So fertilizer impacts the price of apples. The resource price is changing. The number of houses being built for our developer. So we're just doing kind of some basic supply and demand, but the, the, the author is highlighting this for you just to say this is called comparative statics. Where um, those of you who had intermediate, remember we talked about general equilibrium where we look in different markets in different places. Here we're just kind of saying, suppose this parameter changes, we don't know why it comes in, this would be the impact of it. So decrease in population, we have all of our demand shifters and supply shifters. So land policy and prices, labor, we want to bring new businesses in. Um, what's the impact of Ottawa University on the local economy? Traffic congestion. All right, number five, Pareto improvement. Is it possible to do a governmental change that everybody agrees on? that everybody agrees on, everybody in the city. Is it possible to do a change to government policy that everybody agrees with? Pretty hard to do. So there's, in the more complex systems that you have, um, the harder to get a Pareto improvement. So back to microclass, a Pareto improvement was a change such that at least one person's better off without making anybody else worse off. A change that makes somebody better off without making anybody else worse off. And that's pretty hard to do. Now, if there is the opportunity to do that, then you should. And so a Pareto inefficiency is in place if there is a Pareto improvement to be made, right? So this is how we're defining efficient and inefficient. Is it's efficient if you can't make a move that would hurt somebody. Inefficient would mean, oh, I can make a move and make at least one person better off without anybody making worse off. That's kind of a no-brainer. We should do that, right? So whatever the status quo was before was inefficient if you can do a Pareto improvement. Otherwise, um, we are at Pareto efficiency. Okay, questions on that one? That might be a new concept for that, that those of you um, coming out of uh, uh, principles of micro, I don't even think I talk about Pareto stuff in that. So not a big deal, but that's, that's the definition. And it's fun when we do the football region. We won't do the football region. So here's a distribution, potential distribution. Which allocation of coconuts is most fair? M. Six and six. A has A with 12 and zero. B has the opposite. And then we got the three nine. So which one is most fair? M, why? So even is always the determining factor? Is it always even, Stephen? Even though, even though, uh, you know, Abe, Abe is allergic to coconuts. Um, you know, so he's got a coconut allergy or something. I don't know. Is it, is it always... Is even Steven always the fair? Let me go back and say, is 12-0 Pareto efficient? Yes. yes. Why? Because you can't move off of it without hurting Abe, right? So any direction we move here takes away a coconut for Abe and gets it to B. So it is Pareto efficient, but efficiency and equity is another word for fairness, right? Efficiency, equity is kind of what comes about, especially when we start talking about 
uh, government stuff and fix it, carving up a pie or, or distributing s something, right? So um, maybe mom and dad can distribute it fairly. Uh, can the government do that in a good way? Nah, I don't know. You know, it's just it's a difficult thing to do when we don't have all the knowledge that we might need to make a judgment. And one person's view of fairness is different than another. So typically, economists stick in this world, right? And this world is a political thing, right? So the political economy. Now, economists have something to say about the political economy too, because when you're redistributing money. There might be better ways to do it than others. So for instance, a uh, consumption tax is better than an income tax. A sales tax is in general more efficient than an income tax. So in other words, if you are collecting currently 20% uh, income tax, I would suggest that you could create a, an a equal amount of tax revenue by taxing consumption bring in the same amount of dollars and have greater efficiency, right? So that, that's one thing that economists can help do is to try to measure different changes uh, and, and try to show that there'd be benefit doing it a different way. But otherwise, in terms of this, this is more falling into a political football. Okay, questions or comments there? Okay, so those of you who had intermediate econ, this was one of the things we, we covered in this thing where we did the football, and, and this was one of our conclusions that we get, saying that, hey, if we have a competitive environment, then we get good results in society, right? We get, we get efficiency when that happens. And so the problem is, do we have perfect information in the real world? No. Do we have external party benefits in the real world? Yes. Are all the cost of uh, production incurred by firms only and never by you know, pollution or whatever? No. So the point is that that is kind of a, uh, a good thing to, to strive for. And it, it also gives you insight that markets will become more efficient if we correct this problem, right? If we uh, address the property rights issue with, uh, what was I trying to go through, with pollution up here, if we can somehow come up with a mechanism that, you know, polluting the environment's not cool, that we have to have a property right established for air or pollution somehow, then that can be corrected. So it does still, these principles is something that we're striving for, like when we see a problem out there, we can say, oh, okay, we're not, we're having this issue because there's an issue with one of these and maybe we can tackle those things. That makes sense? So we get some good stuff coming out of competition and the efficiencies therein. Okay, so this one's addressing some sort of pollution or health concern, maybe from a, uh, environmental costs. If we add up all of the health cost of the distributed cost of maybe lots of people that are, are having some issues, um, a cost of $100 could create it. So from a cost benefit analysis, uh, marginal benefit and marginal costs, we should do it. But if property rights aren't in place to do that, then it could be difficult. All right, questions or comments there? Okay, so this is fun when we get to this chapter. We'll dive into something like this a lot more. 
So road congestion. So we can break in some sort of what seems to be a pretty small cost and come up with the value of the trip. What do we see on roads in congested, congested areas especially? Not so much in Kansas, we do have a few of these, but what do cities like Miami and LA and New York and um, basically a lot of metropolitan cities, we don't have them in Kansas City. What do we do with the roads? Tolls, Tolls right, so pay per use. So now we increase the cost for the marginal driver who maybe could take the other side trip uh, to avoid the toll, but that's gonna cost them an extra three minutes of time. But eh, three minutes, who cares if that's value? Now, if your wife is currently uh, having your baby, you might just take the tollway, right? All of a sudden, that three minutes is pretty valuable to you. So your value of your time changes as you go through, and so the establishment of tolls or paying for the use can be an approach um, to handling road congestion as opposed to just building more roads or wider roads. Guess what they found out when we just build more roads or wider roads? more traffic, they just fill up, you drive more, like it's more convenient. So uh, what you do, what you build tends to, tends to fill up. Okay, so we can see things kind of building on themselves in some cases. So um, if you expect the price of gas to go up in the future, what do you do today? Go fill up. But as you go fill up, you're changing the demand today, increasing the demand and putting upward pressure on the price, right? So other people that, and this could be in markets for stocks and, um, uh, when when people get kind of speculative and it's like it's going up well everybody's buying that stock oh let's buy Apple let's buy Apple let's buy Tesla right and then other people buy Tesla and as they're buying Tesla not really knowing why they're buying Tesla other people are buying Tesla and it's driving up the price so it's a self-reinforcing mechanism that can lead to um, sometimes some extreme outcomes so what have you seen for automobiles? Those of you who live around here, if you wanna buy a new car in Kansas, where's a place to go buy a new car? A physical place now, we won't talk online. Dealership. The dealerships, where are they located? Those of you, this would be more for those of you who are local. Where do you find them? What's that? Chevy Mission in Payola. Okay, so Payola. Lawrence. Lawrence. Where are the cars, where are the dealers located in Lawrence? On the highway. On the highway, on the south side. How many dealers are there? Two. Roughly. Like three. like three, at least three, I think, yeah. And then in Kansas City, if you're going down uh, up 35 towards the city, Aristocrat Motors, the Nissan, the Lexus, the Honda, the Toyota, every car manufacturer is on that one, I don't know if it's two mile stretch roughly or so. But that's where all the cars are. Why? They're competitors with each other, aren't they? Right? Why are they together? Wouldn't it be better to be distanced? Well, that's not what they find with auto. So we see that all over the place. When people want to go buy a car, they'll start to just go where the cars are. And then we kind of got to let the chips fall where they may. And so kind of similar to our ice cream example, uh, the, the top graph up there is showing, the, the area of the boxes is showing the uh, profits being made, or it's trying to do the, the profits of these people with the location in kilometers here. And so what they found is that if now they locate together, they make more money than what they do is stand alone. And then they start to learn this over time, and now we have all the cars here in that cluster. Right? So they found that the consumer prefers that. If you go to Home Depot and you look around, what might you find? What, what other store might be in iShot? Lowe's and Menards, right? 
the lumber industry, the home improvement industry has found the same thing. That if people want those stores, they would tend to go to a location that has both stores near it. And they're kind of thinking, oh, I gotta go get a dresser today, or I gotta get some materials for this project I'm doing. They know in their head, they don't even know which store they're gonna to go to, but they know where they're gonna go. Because once they get there, they can go to Menards, they can go to Home Depot, they can go to Lowe's. So those stores tend to cluster as well um, in different communities. They have found that um, to be more profitable rather than to go open some standalone store elsewhere. All right, so those are the self-reinforcing uh, concepts. Does anybody know where artists cluster in Kansas City? Kansas City metro area. Right near downtown by the Sprint Center. Power and Light. Yeah, Power and Light, kind of uh, south of Power and Light District is, is where there's a bunch of artists. That's where they have the uh, first Friday. So once a month, the artists kind of put their stuff on display. So. Different businesses, including artists uh, and other people, find it better to work, and we're gonna kind of explore different reasons why uh, they might be doing that. Okay, so now we get into some real economic models. So now this is chapter three. So chapter two, Thursday night, is the back of the chapter chapter two. It's just kind of those principles of making sure you've kind of worked through some problems like that. And um, chapter three, we're gonna think about how towns build and scale up. So the backyard production model. So this is kind of a production possibilities frontier type of thing. So you guys have done this in different ways. Uh, both micro principles, micro and macro, we explore. Uh, this Tom and Jen on the island that I that I do in different classes for um, uh, showing the gains from trade. So the backyard production model, we got equal productivity of labor and land, constant returns to scale in exchange, and constant returns to scale in production. All right, what the heck's productivity? Let's start off with that. What is productivity? We gotta go to the number generator for this one. Where do we leave off with? Julian? One, two, three, four, Mackenzie! And she just stood up, she was trying to leave before she got hit. You were number four. So what is, what is productivity? How would you define productivity? like what you're getting done and what you're like accomplishing when you're like you're working towards a goal and you're being productive to okay. get that end goal. Okay. So um, characterize that in terms of a production process. So instead of a goal, just give me like maybe a short example. I think you're saying, you sound like you're saying the right thing, so. I don't know, like creating something then, like producing something? Yeah, like give me something. Name a something. What's the first something that comes like to mind? Like a new phone. A new phone, okay. A new phone. Okay, good. So what does it mean for um, T-Mobile's software team to be more productive than Verizon's software team? They're selling more. Okay, they're selling more. So their sales Verizon. force, yeah. For an hour of time, they're selling more phones, right? So whatever that goal is, here in, uh, in economics class, we're thinking of output per unit of input. So this would probably be the best way to kind of memorize uh, the idea of productivity. So number of units of output, number of units of input. So if I have 100 phones, apples, bananas, beer, chicken wings, you guys name it, whatever that output is in the production process, sales. If I have 100 units of output and it is done with five people. It could be five hours, or it could be five machines, right? So we're just saying input. Number of units of output divided by number of units of input means that each unit of labor is doing 20 of, let me put it down here, 20 
of output per unit of input. What does that mean in like real world? It would be you know phones per person, per worker. Maybe I should put worker instead of a person. Per unit of labor. Or it's phones per machine. Phones per uh, machine. Machine hour. So all this stuff could be hours, could be machines. You know, it depends on the problem, right? But this is the idea of productivity, the formula that should come to mind. So here we have equal productivity of labor and land. What does that mean? It's an economic model. Just bear with it. It just means that one unit of land gives you 20 units of output and one unit of labor gives you 20 units of output, right? So they're equally productive. Land and labor is equally productive in this two uh, resource model that we're building. All right, constant returns to scale. Who remembers that one? Constant returns to scale. Carlos. Isn't it the one that you increase the quantity produced, you increase the cost? Okay, decrease. When we deal with cost, that's what. Which one is that one? That's not. Economies of scale. It's related, by the way, or there can be a connection. Economies of scale oh, yeah. is that one, which we will come to later. So hold that thought. But here we're measuring dollars in quantity, and it's long run average total cost. So if that goes down, then we say that the more you produce. The cheaper it is on average, that you're taking advantage of economies of scale. So constant returns to scale is there's a real, there's a connection there, but it deals with the physical inputs. Do you want to take a stab at it, Lawson? Does it have to do with kind of like just breaking even in a sense? Like no. Your expenses. No, it's a it's a production relationship. All right, so let's take a look here. Um, with the I thought it was behind the curtain there, but I guess it wasn't exactly there. Constant returns to scale is if you double all your inputs, it's a long run concept. If you double all your inputs, you double all your output. Increasing returns to scale is I double all my inputs and I get more than double output. Decreasing returns to scale is I double all my inputs and I get less than double output. So because I'm changing everything, remember, this is a good time to bring up short run versus long run. What makes the short run the short run? The capital doesn't change. Capital doesn't change or any one resource is fixed, right? So I'm stuck with my building. It's usually capital is the stickier one, right? So at least one factor of production is fixed. That makes it the short run. So when we talk constant returns to scale, it's a long run concept because I'm doubling everything. I'm doubling inputs and then I'm seeing what happens to output. Okay, so um, so together these assumptions eliminate the possibility of exchange. What does that mean? Each household will be self-sufficient. So the backyard production model. So if you have equal productivity and constant returns to scale, it says it eliminates the possibility of exchange and guarantees that each household will be self-sufficient. So we're talking for this model, the way we start off with kind of a baby step, it's almost like 200 years ago in the United States, like each farmer, right? They're kind of self-sufficient. What would cause them to be able to trade with each other? Well, they need to be a little bit different. They can't be perfectly the same. Um, now, through specialization, that could change too, but that's part of what the um, productivity assumption is doing. All right, so under these things, cities don't develop. Okay, so equal productivity. So stitch and squeeze are our uh, people, by the way, if you didn't figure that out. So this is kind of shoes per hour for stitch, 12 shoes per hour, milk per hour, and then one and one. Who has an absolute advantage? Stitch. Stitch, right, is more productive. 
So what's the opportunity cost though is determined internally. So uh, the opportunity cost of a shoe is how much milk? One six, so two twelfths, right? If we put those productivities over there. And then what's the opportunity cost of a milk? That one's kind of easier to see. It's gonna cost us six shoes. And then it's a one for one over here. All right, uh, that's where we'll pick up on Thursday. Comparative advantage. Oh, mark your calendars, you're getting out early today.